Along the whole day, we had a number of questions, and I tried strictly to avoid statements. Well, I believe that now is the time that everyone here present should say whatever they have in mind uh, and start to think about what could be done with this if we are allowed. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, essentially, the question is imagine that uh, I am an entrepreneur or a venture capitalist and say, well, parallel computing sounds interesting. Uh, should I apply to what? Which industry? Should I go to? Gaming? Should I go to genetics? Should I go to uh, financial modeling? How, wh where is the selling point? Because either we are, the aim of the Miniconf has been always putting together different areas, academia, industry, community, but uh, towards where? So let's start with. I, yeah, I, I don't like telling people where to spend their money, but <laughs> I might make an observation that it's, it's in fact the, the gaming, the PC gaming, that drove GPU development, which is now sort of coming full circle. And, you know, someone mentioned before, you can rent EC2 instances with GPUs and, you know, you can buy for you. Sure, sure. But, uh, so, yeah, I'm actually going to dodge that question, but um, I just think it's, it's quite interesting that, that something that you think of as disposable and consumer and kind of light entertainment has actually spawned a revolution or you know the makings of a revolution in high performance computing um, so it's a bit of a counterintuitive outcome i think so paul what should i do with my money <laughs> i was hoping so uh, entertainment has been driving the technology for a long time. Uh, it used to be in the late 80s, people would brag about getting a new machine and their spreadsheet went faster, but mostly it's been the guys playing the multi... Uh, the other... Which scientific, 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 scientific computing is another example. But uh, another example of entertainment uh, more recently has actually been uh, sports. You know, the, in, uh, I'm not sure what they do for this part of the world, where I come from, they put a 10-yard line, a virtual 10-yard line that appears on the television for football, which is how far they have to advance to get another chance to go through things again. And uh, there's also some talk, there's been some talk about being able to uh, use light field cameras, where you have multiple cameras that uh, collect enough light from enough angles to be able to, to produce what the uh, amplitude and direction of light is anywhere in the volume. Uh, which could then be used to uh, get a view uh, in a soccer match right on the field looking at something. Uh, and there, that's going to require a huge amount of computation. It's uh, something that the machines are getting cheap enough that you can imagine doing it. Uh, and, uh, and sports is a branch of entertainment where, they, where the economics are uh, for professional sports beyond belief. So still it's all about economics and entertainment? Well, you said you wanted money. I'm suggesting you follow the money. I mean, that's... <laughs> <laughs> right now in the sports, they, they will sell, they'll sell you a space on the football field and they'll project your ad on top of it after the fact. Mm -hmm. Post, as it were. So there's money in that. So, Wayne, what do you can tell us about this? <laughs> I, I will have a, a question about the, the future. I mean, a lot, a lot of people in this room enjoy parallel programming precisely because it's hard. But I think the average programmer, this, the business developer, is going to see parallelism as a, a burden. It's, it's an extra thing they have to do on top of to simply getting the program correct and out the door on time. It's something they haven't had to do in the past. They've relied on simply processes getting faster, and their program runs faster. So I see it as an added burden. So the unknown to me is what is the mainstream business developer going to have to do in 10 years' time? To what extent will they be thinking parallel? There's always going to be a hardcore group that are very happy and need to do the hardcore parallels in development, but to what extent is it going to impact the mainstream developer in, in the so That's a question I'd like to pose rather than answer. But the mainstream uh, programmer wouldn't be worried right now? Why wait until 10 years' time? Uh, the reason I say 10 years is that there may potentially be a transition period where initially now they need to be worried or they need to do something because there is no other feasible alternative, but perhaps 10 or 20 years, I'm not sure what the period is, but perhaps in the longer term, 
we'll look back on this as being a transition period where later on, arguably, the average programmer doesn't have to, for every single, you know, the majority of the program they develop, they may not have to consider parallelism. I mean, Paul has been talking about the history of the last couple of decades, so what, what I why would, wait uh, again? Well, so what I would suggest you do, what I would ask you to do, go to a medium-sized company and look at the data center, count the number of CPUs, they're already parallel. They may be using single CPU techniques and wiring together um, through TCP IP or any number of things, but uh, except for the very tiniest data centers, they are parallel. And these guys working on the data centers have been learning with you, or how have you done it? Oh, they make their own mistakes and learn their own lessons, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but, well, so, so there's a bunch of different subclasses. Databases have been parallel for decades, mm -hmm. okay? Um, web application servers are inherently parallel and nobody even thinks twice about it, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, all the transaction-based stuff is inherently parallel and, nobody, and nobody's thought twice about it for a long time. But um, uh, I think what it is, is, uh, is that not so much that parallelism is new, it's not, but that the change in economics of, of parallel machines means that things that you wouldn't even think about doing in parallel in the past suddenly, um, aside from the little problem of software, um, are eminently reasonable to do. Well, we had a funny morning about quantum computing and a lot of interesting things because uh, I've been, I always thought, okay, we can do a lot of things better, faster, cheaper, but what about start to think about new things, things that we haven't thought ever before that now are feasible either because they are less expensive or simple because they are feasible. So, Lens. I'm sorry? Quick synopsis, we've seen, like most things that we see in this environment, we've seen it in the mainframe world t for 20 years. We ran, ran out of processor in single processor um, environments. Uh -huh. Multiprocessors came in, locking structures came in. All these discussions I see in the, um, this world now about race conditions and, and overlays and things like this. Have been the, te for a the while. techniques aren't new. Yeah, yeah. It's just a matter of getting people to think about it rather than thinking, my program works, I'll whack it on a quad core, three instances of it start up, and we get an overlay. Hello? I mean, it's, it's, it's not rocket yeah. science. Please, pass it. So now we are on BOE. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm probably, I've, I do small stuff for businesses. So actually, define, you're, define you're, small stuff. It, do, um, conversions from from one type of Excel format to another for inter-business communications, basically the garbage level mo, mo, garbage level programming. It's only small stuff. It has to be written as required. Mm -hmm. I will tell you now. A lot of the times, if I end up using Java, I do not have a choice. You try co coding in Java without using threads, it will kill you 12 ways from Sunday. But this is that simple. Businesses, bu businesses turn around and ask you for a Java program. At this point, whether you want it to go single thread or not, it is already out the question. The world has changed. You don't have businesses walking up and asking you for BB programs that you can write as single threaded pieces, loads of junk anymore. They walk up and ask you, we want something portable, we want something usable. And as soon as they start asking you for languages that have that minimal requirement of threading, it's, it's over for the programmer. The concepts of being single threaded are no more to me. Okay, the world changed, but it mm -hmm. seems that some people still hasn't noticed because we heard today that certain things are not parallelized. Um, but, but it's as, true, as, but <laughs> as languages change and they get less territory and less jobs, they'll simply be weeded out the market. That's the simple fact of it. The world is changing. The ones who haven't caught up are going to be dead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have All a right. mic in the back. We have a mic in the front. So your turn. Oops. <laughs> um, yeah, I think learning more than one language is essential, and learning a functional programming language helps you definitely to think in a different way. And I'm, I'm convinced that functional programming languages help us understand programming multi-core CPUs 
in a, in a different way. It makes it way so much easier. But um, I also fear that functional programming languages probably are not mainstream and will never be. Um, even though it would be a nice world, but um, I think learning about those um, concepts, how to write functional programming languages, really helps you improving your non-functional programming in a, in a big way and helps you getting around a lot of gotchas that you have in fun not functional, non-functional programming. So, yeah. So, yeah, you can ask. <laughs> so, let's say I wanted to learn a functional language. Um, I know you're an Erlang fan. Um, so, would you pick Erlang as the like your first functional language to learn, or would you pick something else? Like, would you pick like it, obviously, like sometimes you get on the web and then you look at some Haskell code and you know you're like, what the hell, you know? Who wrote this? I can't even read it. It's just soup. Um, but uh, uh, so I mean, so, so what would you recommend as the kind of a first functional language to learn? Okay, I am coming and going, but I would appreciate it. That make stars who work too. Okay, yes. <laughs> yeah, I would totally recommend Erlang. Um, not not for the for the reason that I love the language, but for um, the reason that it is. Once you get over the initial hurdle, which you can really literally get over in a day or two, you're at a language that is really easy to read and really easy to understand. Um, Erlang has a very, very clean syntax, and Erlang has a very um, easy and dense way to express problems. And it is very easy to write Erlang or to read Erlang code and understand Erlang code, and that ultimately helps you write Erlang code. So after about probably a week of tinkering around with Erlang, I promise you, you'll be able to write an Erlang pro uh, program that is substantial enough that you can call it a program and it works well enough that you can run it in production. So it is, it is a language that's easy to get into and it's a language that gives you a good feedback in an early stage already. Please. I'll just caddy for the microphone. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yes? <laughs> sorry, in, in the same vein. Uh, uh, louder, please. Sorry, in the same vein as running up might be useful to learn an, another architecture as well, um, especially in multi pro, uh, uh, in multi core programming. Uh, you got different data dependencies, different um, endianness, things like that. Um, but especially the data dependencies, at least and memory ordering in different architectures are, are quite important. So if you're programming for ARM instead of your Intel. Um, and what is IBM doing about Erlang? What's IBM doing about Erlang? Erlang. I'm sure there's, uh, you know, there's over 300,000 people in, in IBM, and if I were able to tell what all of them were doing, um, they would they be very lazy. I, I'm sure that somebody, there's a bunch of people in IBM doing something they're laying. I'm not one of them, and I, I don't know of them. So, okay. <laughs> so. It's a good book to learn Erlang and to get into it. It's a very gentle introduction to the, the basic concepts and, and then goes off into writing really large-scale applications. <laughs> and you are not the author. I'm not the author. I'm not affiliated. <laughs> Erlang at OTP in action. Okay, so I... Before closing, I want to please all of you, the presence, join me, say thank you to all the people, the volunteers that support us with it. They have done a fantastic job. <laughs> and from, oh yes, yes. The presentations onto the shuttle play, uh, oh yes. Yes. See, so if you send it to me, you send everything. I will either on the present or or on the website. <laughs> and uh, can we also uh, thank Nicholas for organising the conference? Thank you very much.